Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session, even under the horrible weather, which is no different from Tokyo under typhoon yesterday. So thank you for coming back. And uh, I'm Ipe Fujiwara, professor of macroeconomics at the Australian National University and the Keio University. And uh, we have truly the distinguished speakers for this economic session. Uh, Professor David Vines from the University of Oxford, and uh, Mr. Hideo Hayakawa, Senior Executive Fellow of the Fujitsu Research Institute, former Chief Economist and Executive Director of the Bank of Japan. Uh, Professor Vines graduated from University of Melbourne with bachelor degree and obtained a PhD in economics at the Cambridge University. He's currently Professor of Economics and a Fellow of Balliol College, at the University of Oxford and is also adjunct professor of economics at the Australian National University. He has so many affiliations, I think I hope right. And uh, he has numerous publications in a macroeconomics in many leading academic journals and also very globally well-known academic economics as an expert of the macroeconomic policies. So we are fortunate to have David Bynes as a speaker. And uh, another speaker is the Mr. Hayakawa. So Mr. Hayakawa is uh, without m any hesitation, Mr. Japanese Economy. <laughs> he knows Japanese economy more than anyone else. So the, uh, Mr. Hayakawa spent most of his career at the Bank of Japan at the Research and the Statistics Department. I don't know the exact number. I believe that it, that it is about 20 consecutive years at the research. Is it right? I think it's about 20 years. So he's a bit like uh, Alex Ferguson of the research function at the Bank of Japan. I'm sorry for those who don't know that Alex Ferguson, but uh, he's kind of the person who managed the Manchester United for a long time. So anyway, so he's a really, really iconic person for the Bank of Japan macroeconomic researches. And uh, Mr. Hayakawa offers and will offer his view on the Japanese economy through not only conjectural assessment and the projection, but also academic perspectives. So we all have learned uh, quite a lot under his uh, directorship at the research function of the Bank of Japan. As a result, there are a considerable number of macroeconomists and academics, as well as investment banks uh, in Japan, who are the graduate of so-called Hayaka School. So that lots of macroeconomists are learned, have learned under, under Mr. Hayakawa. And uh, personally, this economic session is a bit special to me. I learned the macroeconomics from these two uh, distinguished speakers. I learned the dynamic macroeconomics and optimization from Professor Vines when I was a graduate student at Oxford. Then after the completion of my degree, I was assigned a job at the Research and the Statistics Department at the Bank of Japan under the directorship by Mr. Hayakawa. So I cannot thank two distinguished speakers for what I have learned. But at the same time, this means, at the same time, if I say something silly or stupid about the economists, it's, it's not my fault, it's their fault, because <laughs> I learned the macroeconomics from them. So uh, without further ado, we would like to have a first presentation. Uh, please join me welcoming Mr. Hayakawa. Thank you very much, Ipe, for a kind introduction. Um, maybe you, you all but saw, saw, saw me, but uh, anyway. Uh, I'm going to start talking about the outlook for the Japanese economy with some emphasis on abenomics, uh, QQE, and uh, NOP. Okay. Well, um, at the first slide, I explained uh, what are the uh, three arrows of abenomics and uh, what is the QQE but I don't want to spend time here. I assume you already know them. But uh, uh, next uh, several uh, slides, we are going to check what actually happened after the introduction of abenomics as well as uh, QQE. Well, financial market, uh, asset, asset price has, uh, uh, QQE affected asset prices dramatically, higher stock prices as well as a, a cheaper yen. Well, uh, we see some reversal since the uh, beginning of this year or right ahead of last year. But, uh, you know, uh, say as of uh, November 2012, a uh, month prior to Mr. Abe took office, uh, Nikkei was around 8,000 and the yen dollar rate was 80. Therefore, the, even now, uh, stock price is much higher, and, and the yen is much weaker. Uh, the second is, uh, what about the uh, prices? The trend of CPI inflation rate has turned positive uh, since the middle of 2013. 
Uh, right now, year-on-year uh, CPI was about uh, minus 0.5 percent, but uh, it is uh, largely affected by the huge decline in crude oil price. So if you exclude the effect of uh, energy, the CPI still remains positive. So that the uh, uh, Japanese economy is not in, in, in deflation anymore. But uh, you already know, you know that uh, uh, Governor Kuroda uh, declared that uh, Bank of Japan will uh, reach 2% to achieve 2% inflation target in two years. But uh, uh, it's already three and a half years uh, since, since the, that introduction to QQE. 2% uh, target looks still far away. But the more, even more disappointing is actually growth. Uh, we, we don't see any acceleration of growth. Uh, during the past uh, three and a half years. Actually, the average real growth rate under Abe administration was about 0.7, uh, 0.8%. Uh, percent. Uh, one source of uh, uh, surprise was uh, uh, the export. Uh, exports remain, this is orange line, depict uh, a real export, which remain almost flat even with a substantial depreciation of the yen. But uh, one important aspect uh, in Japanese right now is that uh, unemployment rate has come down to 3.0%. And if you look at the job offers to job applicants ratio, uh, this is the, this uh, yellow line, is now uh, 1.37 as of uh, last July. It's almost comparable to the, uh, uh, the Japan's bubble period. So that uh, a labor shortage right now is pretty severe. But as I mentioned, uh, there's no visible acceleration of growth in the past uh, three years. So that this is largely due to the decrease in the labor force reflecting the very rapid uh, aging of population. But, uh, you know, uh, demographic is, is naturally uh, uh, well predicted, so that it's no surprise for the, uh, the demography. But the uh, unfortunate thing is not only labor force decline, but also uh, productivity growth Productivity growth slowing, so that uh, a couple of years decrease, a couple of decrease in, in uh, labor, labor force growth and uh, pro also slowing down productivity, naturally lead to the very lower potential rate of growth. Uh, Japan's potential rate of growth seems lower than 0.5 percent now. Um, it's, a, it's actually 0.2% according to Bank of Japan estimate. Uh, this is the, 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 the uh, gro potential growth rate estimated by Bank of Japan. Also, 0.3% uh, according to cabinet officer uh, estimate. So anyway, it's 0.2 or 0.3. Um, even worse is that uh, uh, Japan's potential growth is not only low, but uh, declining. Uh, according to the cabinet office, uh, the, Japan's growth rate was 0.8% when Mr. Abe took office. So it's come down from 0.8 to 0.3, but anyway. So that was what happened after the uh, three and a half years of uh, QQE, and then, uh, we are going to more closely look at uh, what, what is really going on right now uh, in the Japanese economy. Uh, first, as uh, respect to the uh, household, uh, consumer spending remains lackluster, uh, but it's not by no means surprising. Uh, you know, this is uh, consumption, personal consumption development, but it's not surprising in the sense that uh, you know, uh, nominal wage increase is better limited. But uh, uh, the, the depreciation of the yen naturally push up prices and also uh, 
government increased the uh, consumption tax in the uh, fiscal net 2014. So that uh, real wages actually squeezed. So this, uh, this, this pink uh, bars indicate year-on-year uh, uh, -year changes in the real wages. Uh, real wages declined pretty sharply during the latter half of 2013 to the uh, first half of uh, 2015. So yeah, you know, no, no reason to surprise that uh, uh, consumption remain that aggressive. But the new, good news is that, well, actually, real wage turned positive in the past couple of quarters or so. Um, it's, it's same, very much thanks to the cheaper crude oil price. You know, uh, inflation rate come down, uh, real wage go up. So I, I'm not actually very much worrying about the uh, uh, personal consumption. It's a, it's, I'm not so sure it's throwing going that. But the kind of surprise is uh, more sort of uh, on corporate sector. Uh, corporate earnings improved a sort of uh, historical high in, in the, during the close 2015. Uh, the, this is the corporate earnings, which the peak recorded in 2015 is much higher than the peak uh, recorded pre-crisis pre period. Well, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, wage increase is very modest, and the, also the, uh, uh, this, is, this red line depicts the business investment. This is investment certainly rising, but uh, you know, if you compare the uh, pre-crisis peak, then the current level of business investment is pretty low. So, um, Abe, maybe you know, Abe, Abe, the administration urges businessmen to increase investment as well as uh, wages. It's not a uh, very orthodox uh, economic policy, but uh, well, you know, it's not surprising if you look at this, this sort of chart. Okay, um, one thing I would like to emphasize is that uh, uh, wage development. Well, actually, uh, as mentioned, the wage increase is very modest, but if you look at uh, the hour you pay for part-time workers, this red line, it's actually increasing, uh, almost 2% year on year. This is simply reflect the, the tightening labor market conditions. Um, but uh, uh, this blue line, it's actually um, uh, wage for regular workers. Uh, this is very modest. Um, kind of surprising thing is that uh, this is just, not just because companies are reluctant to accept higher wages. But uh, labor union uh, per se uh, refrain from asking uh, wage increase. Th that's, uh, that's why uh, our wage increase is so modest. Okay, next uh, look at the kind of forecast. Uh, the Japanese economy will likely continue very moderate economic growth uh, during uh, fiscal 16 as well as uh, fiscal 17. Um, even with delaying tax hike, uh, tax hikes are delayed from uh, uh, October 15 to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, April 15 to October uh, 17. And the government make a, a pretty large fiscal package. Uh, private consensus for growth remains less than 1%, kind of 0.7 followed by 0.9%. But uh, remember, 0.7 to 1% growth is substantially higher than the Japan's uh, uh, potential growth, 0.2, 0 0.3%. That means that uh, uh, labor market conditions likely tighten further, uh, and even this uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.9 sort of uh, uh, growth. What about the inflation? Uh, core CPI inflation rate currently less than zero will likely pick up uh, as a negative contribution of energy price will decrease. Uh, we expect uh, uh, CPI inflation rate will likely turn positive as, uh, uh, in, as in the 
end of this year or beginning of next year, anyway, going back positive. But uh, given very modest increase in wages, average core CPI inflation rate in fiscal 17 will unlikely exceed 1%, a much lower than 2% target. Uh, well, actually, Bank of Japan forecasts that uh, uh, CPI inflation rate in fiscal 17 should be 1.7, and they still said that uh, uh, it, may be, it may achieve 2% during the course uh, fiscal 17. But a few people outside Bank of Japan believe that scenario. Uh, the private consensus for the uh, uh, inflation next year is 0.7%. Okay, um, then uh, policy aspect. Well, everybody should know that the Bank of Japan introduced uh, a negative interest rate uh, as of uh, uh, end, end uh, January. Before that, a market participant perceived uh, QQE was approaching the limit. Um, Bank of Japan already ate up uh, nearly 40% of long-term JGB outstanding. Then, uh, continue purchasing uh, 10 trillion yen JGB each month was by no means sustainable. It's impossible, logically. Uh, so that, uh, and also the an IMF paper uh, predicted that uh, QQE would face the limit during uh, uh, 2017 to 2018. Uh, faced with the sharp appreciation of the yen and declining stock prices in the beginning of this year, uh, Bank of Japan decided to introduce a negative interest rate, or NOP. Uh, this is at least more sustainable policy scheme than QQE. But unfortunate thing was that uh, uh, the appreciation of the yen as well as the declining stock prices accelerated further after the introduction of NOV. But uh, I said this is not due to the NOV, but uh, it's just a reflection of uh, uh, global turbulence of financial markets against the background of uh, China risk, so forth. NOV pushed down uh, the entire yield curve, thereby leading to a negative interest rate on 10-year bond. Uh, Bank of Japan predict that this will have positive impact on real economy, but by now, uh, no visible acceleration of growth is seen except for uh, housing investment. Also, a surprising strategy of Mr. Kuroda backfired this, backfired this time significantly. The sudden introduction of NOOP uh, triggered deterioration of consumer sentiment. Uh, especially among elderly. And also, uh, financial institutions are strongly, uh, shows strong resistance against uh, NERP. NERP uh, certainly deduces the profitability of financial institutions. So if low profitability uh, reduces risk taking on the part of financial institutions, it may uh, negatively work against the uh, real economy. Well, Bank of Japan can certainly widen uh, negative interest rate, but uh, the room for maneuver may not be so large. Um, the limit of negative interest rate stems from the existence of cash. Now, if the uh, detail, retail deposit rate come negative, you can withdraw cash from your account. And how much you withdraw uh, depends on the safety and the, and the, uh, uh, the cost of uh, using cash. In this respect, well, Japan is certainly a pretty safe country, so that also the uh, uh, Japan has sti still have very strong uh, custom to use cash. It's pretty hard to uh, you know, pay, use, say, $100 note uh, in the uh, supermarket in the in, in US. But uh, if you pay 100,000 yen uh, in cash in the restaurants or bars, well, they should easily accept it. 
so that uh, you know, in case of Japan, it's very tough to to widen uh, negative interest rate to say one percent, two percent. I don't. I never been to the uh, northern Europe. I heard that uh, <coughs> the limitation to use cash is very severe, much severe than the U.S. So that uh, uh, northern Europe can widen negative interest rate to near one percent. It's probably very difficult for Japan. So with these limitations of both QQE and NOPE in mind, Bank of Japan announced that it will conduct a comprehensive assessment of QQE and NOPE at the, begin, at the, coming, at the coming September monetary policy meeting that's today. Uh, so, yeah, but, uh, nothing happened yet. Yeah, but uh, uh, at, at this point, I, I have I, I no, new, no news on, the, on that. So maybe it's very likely that uh, some, some announcement be made during our session. <laughs> uh, if I find some, some outcome, I, I, I may explain to some. OK, finally, this. Oop. Oh, my god. Um, well, right now, uh, bank, as I mentioned, the Japan, Bank of Japan has an increasing monetary base uh, by means of uh, uh, massive purchase of JJB. Uh, Long-term interest rate to remain extremely low because of Bank of Japan purchase coupled with NERP. But what happens if uh, a Bank of Japan uh, stop buying JJB after achieving 2% inflation target? It very much depends on the uh, market perception on the sustainability of uh, Japan, Japanese government uh, budget. Uh, in this respect, as you know, um, Japan's public debt to nominal GDP ratio exceeds 200% or, or, or 240%, I guess. It's much higher than that of Greece. Greece is at 180%. And the uh, Abe administration committed to achieve positive primary budget balance in 2020. But the uh, assumption behind that is incredibly optimistic. The assumption for this uh, you know, uh, is that uh, it's close to 4% nominal growth and uh, higher than 2% real growth. As I mentioned, Japan's potential growth is 0.2, 0.3%. And in fact, if you look at, if you closely look at behind the uh, figures, uh, you find that the potential growth rate is assumed to jump up to higher than 2% in a couple of years from now. So this is, uh, this is actually so, says that, shows that uh, behind the scene, you know, um, Japanese economy is not that bad for employment. Uh, low growth, but uh, you know, Higher than, higher than potential growth, so that, so so short-term so perspective, that's not really a very bad situation. Uh, inflation is substantially lower than two percent target, but anyway, it's it's term positive. That's big, certainly good news. But uh, well, behind the scene, we have a very large risk. That's a current situation of. Uh, a Japanese going. Let's, let's, I'm going to end on my presentation here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. As Mr. Hayakawa said, that maybe uh, Bank of Japan may release the evaluation of the policy. Then uh, we may be able to have a live coverage and the live evaluation by two <laughs> distinguished speakers. So the second speaker is a Professor Vines. Like that way. Could you come and do it? Uh, let me just say, while this is fixed, uh, that I'm surprised to find myself here. Uh, I don't know very much about the Japanese economy. Uh, that's why I'm surprised to find myself here. Uh, I've done quite. Thank you very much. Quite a lot of work on the world economy, and uh, Europe, and the U.S. and and Australia and the recovery from the global crisis. Uh, and I've always wondered about the Japanese position. Is that right? 
Yep, good. And so what do you do when you find yourself in an unusual position? You, you ring up your friends. Well, my closest friend doing macroeconomics of this work happens to be on holiday in the south of France, and uh, that makes for quite an expensive call on my slightly crazy mobile phone contract. Nevertheless, it was a very valuable call. Uh, then I spoke with Jenny Corbett, uh, who it, you all know is a great expert on the Japanese economy, and she recommended me to uh, a, a report to me which I'm going to make use of and which I'd like to tell you all about now by John Plender. It's called Japan's Sustainability and fin Financial Stability, and it's to be found on the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum website, a gathering of think tanks and central bank officials, uh, and is a very valuable piece. It just went up, I think, a day or so ago, and, and I'm told by Jenny, just as I came into this lecture, that I'm now able to refer to it. Uh, uh, fourthly, I uh, was very much helped by seeing Mr. Harikawa's slides, and he's given me permission to use one or two of them to show some facts about the Japan in, in my talk. And finally, I found something very helpful in The Economist uh, two months ago, which I'm going to refer to at the very end. Now, why did I say all that to you? It's because to explain that because I'm an outsider, I thought it useful to try and go right back to the beginning and try and understand how we got here. You quite properly, Mr. Hayakawa, didn't do this, but spoke about the needs of the minute. I'm going to try and understand the needs of the minute in relation to how we got here. Now, how we got here is uh, two and a half decades of what's been known as a balance sheet recession with huge structural imbalances and adverse democratic, uh, demographic trends. You could even follow this on my computer, which, if you like. <laughs> that was the noise. I was <laughs> you can go back to the beginning. And, there you are. You keep going backwards. Now you've lost the page. But, oh, OK. okay. Yeah, no, I, 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 Some initial successes, the program has stalled, and uh, Mr. Hayakawa and I are going to talk about why that has happened. And it is important for the world that we understand where Japan is and what the likely success is. Um, now, the three arrows which you've heard about, let me remind you, aggressive monetary policy, flexible fiscal policy, and structural reform were designed to combat these sustained problems. Remember the problems being balance sheet recession, huge structural imbalances, and under, uh, underlying this a, a, a problem which you can't easily counteract, although I'll talk about this, the demographic trends. Um, in my talk, I'm going to discuss why the three arrows haven't fitted together. To take Professor Curtis's remark, I only understood this morning the significance of this three arrows metaphor, uh, but I would put it in saying that because one of the arrows has been broken, the other two arrows didn't work. Uh, and that's a slightly different story from if you stick all the arrows together, somehow they'll co help each other not to break. And it's that way round that we need to think about what's happened and why it's been difficult. But secondly, I'm going to talk at the end of my talk about how this is a global problem and your talk was almost entirely a domestic talk, very understandably. My conjecture, which I'll leave you with at the end, is if you'd been trying to do Abenomics uh, 15 years ago, it would have been much easier, and quite possibly a, a very rapid route to enthusiastic victory. And it's the trying of this strategy at this moment that has proved to be so difficult. You'll see why. Uh, there we are. Where did we get here? Um, 
origin in the boom in asset prices and the subsequent bust. And very similar to the general idea of the subprime crisis in the US, uh, boom in asset prices in US housing, uh, very leveraged financial institutions connected to that uh, boom and crash. And the, 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 the fall noted on this slide, uh, just how much the fall was, really a staggering amount. As uh, Ku has said, equivalent to three times the loss of wealth in relation to GDP that the US incurred during the Great Depression of the 30s. It's a huge crash. Um, and that crash led to a banking crisis. And there are the numbers that, again, I've uh, picked up from outside. Nationalization of seven banks, 61 institutions closed, and 28 merged. That's a serious restructure of your whole financial system. But it's taken 15 years. So everyone has said too slow, uh, but it's also ver been very difficult. Uh, and in response to collapsing asset prices, and to difficulties in the financial system, the private sector companies in the private sector have responded by shrinking their asset values and by deleveraging. You'll see how crucially important that is. This is all very familiar in standing back from the GFC. And you ask yourself, what was that all about? And you know, try and collapse that into a few sentences. That was really an asset price collapse and subsequent deleveraging. We understand how to think about that, uh, although macroeconomic theory hasn't been very good at understanding it, that set of issues, but, but don't let me go sideways into that discussion. Um, the outcome was a protracted balance sheet re recession, and this recession led to deflation. There were occasional bursts of growth, and the famous one is the mid-90s, which was brought to a brutal end by a tax rise that came too early, uh, and which we all uh, use, those of us who like um, talking about mistaken pursuit of austerity, that is a good example. Now, uh, the first of the sl slides that I'm pitching, pinching from Mr. Hayakawa's uh, d d talk is this picture. Uh, the most significant of the imbalances which has been caused is this staggering uh, question in relation to non-financial non corporate sector investment. Normally, corporations uh, <coughs> account for well over half of gross domestic product in advanced countries. They are the largest users of attainable savings, and they use their own retained earnings and depreciation allowances. But in normal times, they borrow from the rest of the economy, relying heavily on the household sector for funds. But look at this picture. There's profits, the blue line, and uh, the, the blue line, and there's investment, the red line. A staggering withdrawal from the circular flow of income by the corporate sector because it's unwilling to invest. You can say that that means that cash flow has been trapped in the corporate sector. Now, it's also been the case that consumption hasn't grown rapidly. Um, wage increases for, for regular workers have been subdued, and you talked about that, uh, not just because companies uh, have been reluctant to offer this, but because unions have, in the climate, refrained from asking. Real wages have, uh, uh, have been under real pressure. Now, the, the macroeconomic, simple Econ 101 macroeconomic analysis that an outsider brings to this understanding is that there's a macro difficulty in those circumstances if both corporate investment and private sector investment are subdued. And that's revealed in that simple piece of algebra for anyone who finds it helpful, that aggregate demand equals the sum of consumption, investment, government expenditure, and the trade surplus. And if that demand 
those demand components are to remain equal to aggregate supply, which I've written depending on the production system of the economy, its capital and its labour, if the Y on the first line is to remain equal to the Y on the second line, and if both C and I are low, then there's an issue. And if exports, if you can't have what we all love calling export-led growth that's strong enough, then X minus M isn't big enough, and you become what I describe as reluctant Keynesians. You either face an ongoing underutilization of resources, or you in have to increase government expenditure. Another way of putting the same point is the next semi-paragraph, that it's the case that saving, that d leakages across the macroeconomy have to uh, match injections. And if savings are very bigger than investment, and exports minus imports, the trade surplus is not big enough, then G must be bigger than T, that's to say a deficit. And such an excess leads to the accumulation of debt. And that's the reluctant Keynesian explanation of why public debt has been rising, has risen to astronomically unusually high levels in Japan, known only during wartime elsewhere. Um, now, so you, this problem is pinned to the failure of the third arrow. No, I'm, that's looking forward. Looking backwards, it's pinned to the failure of corporate investment to, 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 to be large enough. And this is where the discussion has to focus. Uh, Larry Summers and heaps of followers in America have discovered these ideas, which they've given the grand name of secular stagnation. And these ideas were relevant to Japan 15 years before people began to woke up to them in the US. That when, when demography is uh, such that population isn't growing, um, lower levels of growth and it need, le needs less investment. Uh, think of Jason's talk this morning, buzzing out of that talk was people like to invest where the markets are growing. Uh, this is the opposite of that. But secondly, there's been a failure to innovate, which specialists will know about, and I'm an outsider and just pick up what I've heard about this. One way of thinking about it is perhaps that much of that technological dynamism that we all thought was so wonderful about Japan 15 years ago was attached to the whole production system that grew out of manufacturing catch-up in that great golden age from 1945 to the mid-1970s. And the Japanese were amazingly good at that. Have they gone on being amazingly good at enough? Many, many things, but perhaps not enough. And certainly, if the things that you're good at require low-wage mass production technology of the kind that the Japanese car industry was so wonderful at, you do that now in China and in other places where, and, and China's finding it hard. You do it in Vietnam and you try and, to, it's not Japan any longer. Thirdly, the, 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 the Japanese companies have relocated Ever since wages have risen, I remember as a graduate school being told about the flying geese model of foreign investment. You take your stuff where you can find low wages, and that stuff increasingly was taken out of Japan. Now, um, it's also the case, and here we go to Abenomics, the, this corporate hoarding instinct not investing enough had, was associated in the run-up to Abenomics w with, with policy failures. Not a competitive enough exchange rate uh, and uh, deflation which allowed high real interest rates which encouraged the deferring of investment. Now, that first I'm going to come back to a story about the need to have a depreciated exchange rate and a trade surplus 
there are issues there of international cooperation and conceivability and possibility, which have gone right back to discussions about Japan, which many of us had with Max Gordon 25 years ago. Uh, nevertheless, had there been a more depreciated exchange rate, forgetting everybody else's objections, Japan would have grown more rapidly in the period running up to uh, the, the Abenomics change. And, and, and that growing more rapidly would have made it possible to avoid deflation and the high real interest rates that came with it. So, why have I now stopped being able to make this? I, I must have pressed a stop button, but, but uh, I can probably just go down like that, can't I? Brilliant. Yeah, no, I wanted to go to the, perfect. Can I just go like that? Yep, very good, terrific. Um, there we are. That's, the, that's where it started. The first arrow was to address deflation through radical quantitative and qualitative easing, and a depreciation was crucial. The second was fiscal expansion. This is to go backwards. We need to get the level of public debt down, but first of all, we need a fiscal expansion to make it go up even further. Uh, my friend Chris Alsop has a wonderful metaphor about how if you're trying to turn a, a tanker to the left and you are located at the back of this ocean liner, the way to get the ocean liner to go to the left is to turn the rudder which will make the back of the ocean liner go the wrong way before the liner goes like that. And there's something of that idea in this fiscal expansion initially. But it was supposed to come along with structural reforms, the third arrow, strict bargaining, power of labor, uh, deregulation, corporate governance, increased spending, all that stuff. But all that stuff was designed to overcome the difficulties of corporate investment that have been at the center of my the play in this story. And the first arrow has been very successful. Two more pictures, thank you very much, from your talk. Just look at the left-hand one. That's the, uh, what it did to the stock exchange. You would say that a rise in asset prices would encourage investment. And look on the right-hand side to what it did to the uh, this nominal exchange rate, isn't it? Rot's not real. Um, uh, and, and please don't look too far to the, to the right in that picture. While it goes up, that's good news, and we'll come to the, the, the last bit in a minute. That's, that's terrific. Uh, the next thing was that it, deflation was really, I think, defeated is the right word. Not, not comprehensively got to 2% with victory, but this picture, which you talked about earlier, shows the CPI, which is the hard line, less food. And there's all sorts of jumble about energy and difficulties. But look how different that is, whereas uh, from 13, 14 until later, 14, 15, 16, which we'll come to. So too early to say defeated, but certainly pushed in the proper direction until things again began to go wrong in 15. And finally, uh, you talked about how growth uh, rate has not been wonderful, uh, but the underlying supply side with low technical progress and low population growth has seen an economy in which the growth of productive capacity has not been rapid. And even although this doesn't look terrific, the output gap has very significantly narrowed. And that, in the end, as I, I speak as a macroeconomic manager, given the productive potential of the economy, it's the output gap that you're attempting to deal with. And there has been, we nod, a move in the right direction. It's terrific, that first. Uh, story until the last year and a half. However, it didn't have the effect of, uh, of increasing investment as it had been hoped. Um, 
for all the reasons that I talked about at length that were underlying the difficulty of getting investment up in the earlier period. Furthermore, many people now say that Japanese firms are taking the increased profits which have come as a result of the devaluation, not as an encouragement to get out and do more net exports and increase aggregate demand, but instead to have a nice time with increased profits and not really bother as much. And there is serious discussion about which way this set of incentives are pushing in discussion. Um, <clears throat> secondly, what devaluation does to consumers doesn't help either because it depresses real income and that depression of real income lowers real wages and means that consumers spend less. And I'm looking at what's happening on the uh, on, uh, <laughs> next to me. Is there an announcement that I should stop to, uh, to allow you to make? No, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> but, but it looks from the busyness as if there may be an announcement. So we should all uh, look forward to this. Uh, so so uh, the second arrow has become has been problematic. Balancing the requirements of growth and fiscal consolidation has been really difficult. Um, and guess what? 2014 tax increase. It looks like the abonomic story of, remember my ocean tanker, go the wrong way before you start going the right way. The attempt was to try and make the back of the ocean tanker go that way too soon. And when you do that, you don't end up with the ocean tanker going the right way. It goes that way. And that is what has happened with that tax increase. And everyone now thinks that postponement of the budget balancing moves is the right thing to do. First of all, postponement, and now even the fiscal stimulus is the right way to go. But look what that does to your final picture on your talk, shows us what that does. The red line was what Abenomics was meant to do, get the surplus back into uh, a positive, that's just minus minus, get it into a surplus, red line, but uh, actually we look like with the change in fiscal policy postponing that, uh, that's now minus two and it goes off the page at minus two. The third arrow has even, of course, been as you'd expect me to say, unfinished business. And the reminder of why is just to take you back to what I talked about earlier. Demography, not enough innovation, relocating to the rest of the world. And, 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 but there's an important point, a caveat, which uh, Ambassador Sumio Kasawa, Kasaka raised in his talk to a group of us last night at dinner. To the extent that the national economic model becomes one in which you invest abroad and repatriate income, and that income gets spent domestically, that's, and the focus of that is that gross national income grows more rapidly than gross national product. To the extent that you can do that, you can steer around this going abroad feature and increasingly in a globalized way, that's one of the things that you should be imagining you should do to moderate the difficulties that we've been describing. And, and all of these features, as I said at the bottom of my slide, call us back to what Jason said at his talk at the beginning of today, much of your talk was about the sorts of policy movements that the Japanese might make in order to steer around these underlying difficulties, no, that's the wrong word, try to reform these difficulties that, uh, in, that, have, that stand in the middle of the problem in the way I've been presenting it in, in this lecture. Now, why did I say that it's harder to carry out abonomics now than it would have been 15 years ago. Well, <coughs> this has been a world in which there's been a very slow global recovery from the GFC. All of us 
uh, hoped that we'd be in a much better place in the advanced industrial world than we are now, pushing 10 years from the crisis, which began seriously in 2007. Uh, I am one of those who think, along with the most famous two, it, it, much more famous than my discussion of this thing, Paul Krugman in, in the UK and Simon Ren, in the US and Simon Ren Lewis in the UK, who have been ever since the beginning very clear-minded uh, opponents of austerity. And it's clear to understand that at the G20 meeting in London in 2009 uh, and in the previous meeting in Washington in late 2008, there were agreements both in London to stimulate aggregate demand by 2% of world GDP, a huge stimulus, discretionary in London. And that had been, a, that followed the <coughs> determination to allow the automatic stabilizers to operate. That's to say when activity falls and tax revenues fall, you don't put up taxes, you allow a deficit. Probably even two or three times as important as the London decisions. In 2010 in Toronto, the global leaders, led, I'm afraid, by our then Chancellor of the Exchequer and Schäuble from Germany and an entangled American uh, <coughs> uh, administration, towards an agreement to cooperate globally in doing austerity. And this cooperation to do austerity globally has led very directly to exchange rate warfare. The non-cooperative prisoner's dilemma, I want my growth to rise, I'm not prepared to allow demand to increase in my country, so I'll carry out QE to devalue the exchange rate and steal jobs from other people. And that's the world that we've been living in since then, and look at what that does to the exchange rate in Japan and the last part of this story. And I think that is a part of why exports have not recovered, and I think it's also a part of why the inflation story has gone backwards from the achievements earlier on. Uh, I would also add, and I'll say in a minute when I get to that point in this slide, that this exchange rate movement has been part of what Elaine Ray and her, in a wonderful paper she gave at the European Central Bank meeting in Sintra two months ago, about how global portfolios are properly thought of not using the efficient markets hypothesis which has bedeviled uh, much of economics. Uh, but instead a serious understanding of the portfolio preferences of international investors. And in those circumstances, when things like Brexit happens, you run for safety. And one of the things that you did in running for safety was run for Japan. Uh, unconnected, importantly, unconnected, but a globalized world and in a global world, you go to the one that's nearest to you when you're uncertain. And that's part of what's happened to, 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 to the uh, value of the yen. But the additional point that I want to make is simply that world markets are not growing. It's very difficult to sustain aggregate demand growth in a world where world trade has been growing so extraordinarily slowly. But more than that, and again Elaine Ray has talked about this, the international transmission of, of t conditions in credit markets from country to country mean that none of us as macroeconomists are anywhere near as confident as five or ten years ago about the ability of one country to isolate itself from global conditions in, in global markets. And this has been a world of uncertainty in global markets in which investors in Europe and the US as well as in Japan will not invest. And that's to do with a whole sequence of uncertainty difficulties and they have imposed themselves on Japan. So you can see why 
what I've said on this page, says to you, if you tried econo economics 10 years earlier, you would have found it a lot easier to try and do it than, than now. Uh, but is this a crisis? I think that the proper way of thinking about this in, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing now, uh, is, is to compare what's happened in Japan with the uproar in my own country that led to Brexit, the uproar that's leading to Trump, uh, the disaffection uh, in much of Europe about a very important part of the social community feeling disengaged and left behind by the growth model that their political leaders have adopted. And this has not been true in Japan. Although, says the economist, summarizing this point very clearly, uh, the expectations of uh, <coughs> abonomics have not been met, and prog progress has been incremental, nevertheless, Mr. Abe's method has been to make partial progress on many fronts at once. And most importantly, this in one sentence says, thanks to high employment and a cohesive society, ja Japan feels little sense of underlying urgency. The Japanese seem to prefer, prefer two words I can't pronounce properly, kaizen, or continuous improvement, to kaikatu, a uh, pejorative word for reform. Uh, I don't think that this is a crisis. I do think that the northern European and US economies, for different social reasons, face a crisis. But my talk says that it might go on for a long time. <clears throat> it depends on whether investment can be made to rise, and as I've said crucially, this depends importantly on what happens in the rest of the world. And so I end with the $64 million question, when will public debt begin to come down? And the answer is, who knows? <laughs> but I am not one of the people who thinks Unlike John Plender, whose wonderful piece uh, s swerves into a prophecy of universal crisis for the all of mankind because of the size of the Japanese public debt, my view is that however difficult it will be, once growth begins again, and it will happen, and once inflation goes above naught, one, two, and maybe three, maybe even a little more, we will see public debt begin to fall. It will happen slowly, just like it did after the Second World War. We all have very short attention spans, but this is going to be a generational pro project to get public debt again down after what has happened. I don't think that this not quite a crisis, slow reform, gradual as she goes, is going to be anything other than a very gradual process of rectification of these imbalances, but it will take a very long time. Thanks. Thank you very much to speakers. So that, uh, David raised a very important point. You know, if you know how to increase the growth, everything solves. So, but it's, <laughs> it's a difficult problem. Yeah. And also, the Mr. Hayakawa pointed out the very, very important lesson. So that maybe you have learned in uh, undergraduate macro textbook. So corporate sector is the investing sector, and the household sector is a saving sector. But you know, corporate saving has been continuing more than 15 years in Japan. And uh, everybody thought it's just uh, something happened in Japan, maybe due to the crazy policy. But uh, that kind of thing is happening all over the world. And that is a kind of the, uh, the something mentioned in the David Vines' uh, presentation as well. So uh, we have uh, several minutes. So that, do you have any? I would, I would like to have some questions and the comments. So start. Could you tell your name and affiliation? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Vibhor. I'm a master's student. So I would like to uh, talk about the economics of Olympics. Historically, <laughs> Olympics has been a loss-making exercise. Apart from Los Angeles 1984, we have the example of Sydney 2000, the economic disaster of Athens uh, 2004, and Rio 
would join that list. So, as uh, the government of Japan uh, may uh, take in steps to make sure that Tokyo 2020 is not a not an economic disaster, uh, and or is it a is it an exercise in soft power projection? Uh, and can Japan, if it is a loss making exercise, can Japan sustain that given the current state of economy? Well, I don't say that. Maybe the <coughs> microphone. Yeah, no, no, here is that. No, no, it's okay. Okay, sir. Okay, I don't think the, uh, uh, the Olympic causes uh, uh, disaster in the Japanese economy. But uh, well, uh, many Japanese kind of expecting that uh, uh, Olympic game has a very stimulating e effect on Japanese economy, but I don't think so. Uh, well, if the uh, J current situation is such that we have a large uh, unemployed in, in our country, then the uh, well, probably uh, Olympic Games can stimulate investments so forth, and therefore it's good news for economy. But uh, well, we are already starting from full employment then you can expect the expansion from just doing uh, Olympics games. Usually, uh, resources uh, you know, spent to the or preparing Olympic games is not as productive as uh, uh, usual private investment. So that uh, usually you, you expect, uh, uh, to some extent, rather deteriorate uh, the productivity of, of the economy. So I don't expect uh, Disaster, but uh, I do not dreaming of <laughs> yeah. dreaming of recover of J Japan because of the Olympics. That's there's no reason to believe that. That's my answer. Right. So, David, do you want to add something or no? For them? No, no, no. It's very clear. Yeah, I'm I'm teaching the first year undergraduate student a bit of the superior regression with the Olympic game and the growth. You know, maybe like if you see the Tokyo or Seoul and the Beijing, you know, growth rate is high when the Olympic game is on. But it's other way around because the growth is high, they are hosting Olympic games, so that it's not so easy to evaluate Olympic effect. Okay. So, <laughs> do you have any question? What yeah. about Brazil? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Li uh, Fang Song from ANU. Uh, uh, two comments to David's uh, presentation. Uh, you said is the, uh, the big gap between saving and investment, which actually a positive one, allows government expenditure uh, you know, to continue to go over the, uh, the, the revenues. I'm wondering about uh, the saving uh, uh, investment ratio in Japan. Given the uh, demographic change, the rapid falling of saving ratio, so therefore you can see the gap is narrowing. So in a way that is becoming intolerable for Japan to continue to have this, uh, you know, the gap between uh, revenue and uh, expenditure. That's a common one. The second one you actually mentioned in towards the end of a conclusion, very important point. The falling of investment in Japan is very much due to the, uh, the failure to, to in innovate. So I, I think it's a very important uh, dimension in the arrow three of the re structural reform to find the impetus to innovate. I don't see a third reason you listed about the migrant industry to offshore in the kind of a lower end is actually preventing Japan from uh, becoming more innovative. It's actually the way to go, you know. But high end continue in Japan to be innovative. There's a certain room there for, you know, for that to happen. So the trigger for that one. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, come up and uh, very interesting uh, presentation, very updated. <coughs> My comment is that it seems to be very unrealistic to have the potential growth rate rises to 2% <laughs> yeah. in, in the short run. The reason is very simple. Potential growth rate is determined by the growth rate of the labor force, which is falling in Japan. Secondly, it's about improvement, the speed of improvement of productivity, which is also very, very low. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is one dimension. The other one is about a gap between the two actual growth rate and the potential growth rate. So lift that one through reform. So what is the, the prospect of doing that one through the, the structural reform? Finally, it is about uh, you mentioning that a negative interest rate policy is actually more sustainable compared with the, uh, the Q quantitative easing. So what is the justification for, for, for that argument? My, the only thing I can say is that it's because the Japan government is heavily on debt. So therefore, negative interest rate is actually good for the data. But I don't know. Thanks. I think uh, two questions to David and the three questions to uh, Mr. Hepa. So, okay, so. Uh, 
if, if, if the savings gap is narrowing, that's a good thing, but uh, it doesn't yet seem to be narrowing enough. That final projection which I put up from your talk still showed the deficit at 2% of GDP uh, going through to 2020. Uh, that, uh, given that the whole of the management of the Japanese economy is being done by people who would love to close that deficit if only they could, that projection is a story about the private se se sector savings investment gap still not narrowing enough. Enough, improving, but still, that projection suggests not, not enough is really all I can say about that. Um, <clears throat> Innovation uh, uh, is crucial. I don't have anything interesting to say about that, and perhaps, perhaps you do. On negative interest rates and QE, I think that we've found even in Europe, that this difficulty for the financial system of actually be having its lending impeded by negative interest rate policy is a real problem. Uh, but I don't yet see any alternative to it. it. It just makes the only available weapon less useful. But just because you so show that the only available weapon is less useful, you don't somehow celebrate and say, let's declare victory, which <laughs> many people seem to think that simply not using the most available w weapon would enable them to wake up in the morning and find the world had fixed itself. And, and, and I don't think that's true. With respect to the uh, potential rate growth, I never uh, thought of that uh, Japan's potential rate growth jump up to 2% in the, in the, within the two years or so. And it's, it is the assumption under the, 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 uh, you know, the, the government program for the, the, the consolidation of uh, Japan's uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal conditions. So that uh, I, I do not believe that, but it is the assumption of the government That's plan. The and yeah. Yes, and also the uh, with respect to the um, negative interest rate and uh, QQE, as I mentioned, uh, you know, J J Bank of Japan already ob uh, absorbed nearly 40 percent of uh, long-term JGB outstanding. So if you continue buying 10 trillion yen per month, it cannot be sustained. You know, it's logically impossible. So on the other hand, uh, so let's say 0.1, uh, 0.3 percent negative interest rate, which can be sustained. Uh, you know, you, you can com uh, continue that policy a long time. So that's uh, more sus at least more sustainable. But this point, um, I uh, actually uh, during the presentation, uh, Professor. Uh, and, 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 and actually, Bank of Japan released uh, the uh, policy choice this time, and uh, w actually no real action this time. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, oh, this uh, is a live commentary on the current <laughs> policy. Okay. But uh, basically, <laughs> they, they, they determined the kind of two things. Uh, one is uh, uh, they said that uh, kind of uh, um, yield curve control, but uh, it's basically kind of a, uh, targeting on uh, long-term rates. And uh, uh, the Bank of Japan started, uh, in the past, Bank of Japan always said that decline in the long-term rates is good news, but uh, uh, recently, um, uh, Governor Kuroda, as well as uh, Deputy Governor Nakasto, started to talk about uh, side effects of, t of two flattened uh, yield curve. Therefore, the, uh, they said that uh, they implicitly sort of uh, target that the 10-year 10 10 -year rate be around zero, not uh, negative 2.2 percent like that. This is sort of this kind of a uh, long-term uh, rate targeting. And so they introduced that sort of scheme. And second thing is that uh, they uh, actually they admitted kind of uh, overshooting. Uh, in the past, you know, this is kind of already a sort of a determined policy. They said that uh, government of Japan continue quantitative easing, uh, the not just achieving 2%, uh, confirming that uh, uh, 
uh, over 2% uh, uh, inflation stabilized. So that, uh, in, in, to some extent, Japan naturally allows uh, some sort of overshooting, say uh, CPI inflation rate, just, not just for 2.0 percent, kind of 2 percent, even 5 percent. It's a, it's a, you know, Ipe knows well, but <laughs> certainly this dynamic control requires that sort of overshooting. Absolutely. So that's a, actually this is a, a kind of a, kind of a common sense among the macroeconomists. But uh, actually, Bank of Japan uh, formally admitted that possibility of overshooting. That's a basically two. Uh, uh, determination which they made this time. This is an outcome of a comprehensive assessment. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So uh, David would like to add something. Let me just say two things about long-term interest rates. Uh, I, I sound like someone who thinks that long-term interest rates are a good idea for however long they're needed. And I am such a person, but but uh, uh, I'm also somebody who is aware of how serious the side effects of these are. Let me say what I think is the major one. It bankrupts most of the pension systems in most of the advanced countries. And so uh, if you want people like me to be able to live in their old age in a sensible way, and you continue with low long-term interest rates, then you're piling up fiscal obligations on the state that will either have to declare me to get no pension and sorry, have a bad life, or else adopt the debt as higher public debt. Serious negative implications of perpetual long-term interest rates. So let, my second thing is to discuss what happens when at last growth begins to pick up and we begin to go back towards the new normal and we begin to go down that uh, wonderfully exciting uh, tapering world. Uh, uh, the, this, my ocean tanker is a good example. It's quite difficult to steer an ocean tanker when you have to make the backward part go the wrong way when you're trying to go somewhere. But that doesn't mean that steering the tanker is impossible. And the task uh, facing policymakers is, to, is very simple in the following sense. You only have to rise the interest rate when growth has begun to pick up enough to make inflation again a problem. Now, to say, but uh, excuse me, when you raise the interest rate, that'll cause a great recession and will, everything will collapse, is in danger of being a logical contradiction because the policymaker doing this would look at you and say, don't be so stupid. I'm only raising the interest rate because the economy is growing too fast. If I face this collapse, which is frightening you, guess what? I would lower the interest rate again. What's more, everyone will know that I would do that. So the prospect of this causing itself to collapse is, I think, a piece of magical misunderstanding. That's not to deny that steering the way through the middle will be difficult, just like steering the ocean tanker. But there is a way through the middle. And to assert that any attempt to go on the tapering world is necessarily going to cause the universe to implode is the John Plender error in his discussion, which I recommended to you so much, but I will now finish by saying only for the first part of what he said, but not the second yeah. part. I think the chair the uh, two talkative uh, you know, presenters are uh, good, but a uh, bit tough. But, uh, I, I, okay, so the last uh, quick question, because I'm um, <coughs> using the, my advantage, taking advantage of a chair, I would like to ask one question, so. Just yeah. um, How do you respond to the hypothesis that some research is putting about that Japan, because it entered the demographic transition much earlier than all other developed nations, mm -hmm. was the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> and the policymakers really don't know how to manage a world economy yeah, right. where every developed nation, or just about every developed nation, has now passed the point that Japan reached in 1990. They passed that point somewhere between 2005 and 2010. 
I need to have the same question so that can I can I follow you so that you know when I when we discussed this kind of thing 10 years ago lo lots of people thought it's something specific to Japan mm -hmm. you know just due to the stupid policy but uh, nowadays you know lots of developed countries are following what uh, Japan followed so that maybe I'm following your question so that do you think is it something specific to Japan or maybe other developed countries also follow what uh, Japan followed or if you find Find any differences? Uh, it would be great if you mentioned this. You is it okay? So that we'll both, okay. We'll both say yeah, we both. first. Well, uh, talkative is great, but uh, we have been running okay. out okay. of time. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but uh, okay. Um, uh, demography so forth is kind of you know, common, and not only uh, advanced economy, but also the uh, you know, many of uh, uh, East Asian uh, countries like uh, China. Uh, Korea, so forth. This is kind of common. One um, sort of uh, peculiar thing about Japan is one is that uh, uh, well, we are too slow uh, in, in response to the uh, problem in the financial system. You know, uh, we uh, yeah. yes, uh, bubble burst in uh, 1990, but uh, you know, 15 we, years, yeah, yeah, 15, yeah, we yeah, take yeah. 15 uh, long time to to restore financial system. That's just kind of a uh, situation in, in Japan. In, in, in that respect, U.S. response was very fast, but uh, Europe is not necessarily so. Exactly. That's, that's, yes. a, that's a difference. Yeah. And also, the uh, 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 one other big problem is that, uh, <coughs> you know, um, um, you know, you know, in the last session, Uman Max uh, talked about the uh, problem, problem in Japan's uh, labor market. And uh, it's not just a uh, woman, but uh, various uh, problem in Japan's labor market. So something um, uh, in particular in Japan, I think one is a slowness in the response against uh, corrupts and financial system. And, then, and that's the thing is probably problem in the uh, uh, labor market. So I think in that sense, um, uh, US is much better in two respects. Uh, but they had their problem. Um, Europe seems somewhere in between. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so that's your turn. <clears throat> You're dead right about the canary in the coal mine. That's an, a way of putting what I said about Larry Summers. He woke up to this 15 years after people for Japan woke up to it. And, and let's be clear uh, that there are probably enough people in the world and, and out there are people who worry about climate change and all sorts of raw material difficulties. So, so economists are better understand how to manage a world which, uh, in which in 80 years time the population won't be growing. Here's my medium term uh, resilement from that challenge, running away from it. It's very like the second, after the Second World War when people began to realize that what was needed was development of the underdeveloped regions. Development economics didn't begin until, roughly speaking, Galbraith went to India and came back and told everyone in Harvard it was important. Uh, but, but it had begun earlier in Europe with the development of Eastern Europe. And those who were, and that's why the World, World Bank was founded, to enable advanced countries to grow by exporting useful things, capital equipment, projects, bridges, you name it, to the emerging developing part of the world. Well, there is still, Roscano will give you a speech about how that's important still in China and India, and if only we could uh, uh, ensure that world financial markets would safely transfer capital to those parts of the world which, where there are still two and a half billion, really, three billion really poor people that need capital investment to develop. That's the job, and then there's Africa, where the population is going to be very slow to stop growing. Uh, that's the job for the next 50 years, and, and, and I would say that the task in the next 50 years is finding a way safely internationally of transferring capital to places that need it. And that's a huge task in international management. Do you reverse element of that as well in terms of transferring labor? Uh, yes, and we're seeing how difficult that is at the minute. Uh, it, it, certainly. 
have you satisfied? Okay, do you want to talk more? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so please join me thanking two lively presenters for the fantastic role. Thank you. Real pleasure.